All right, thank you. I, I don't know what to say because that was basically my presentation. Uh, so I, it's putting me in a very, very difficult uh, situation. Uh, guys, customer centricity. Uh, I'm very, very excited to be here uh, today and talk to you about how Amazon is approaching customer centricity. Uh, it's, it's very emotional to be back here. Uh, I haven't been back in uh, six years uh, plus. As Aaron mentioned, uh, shortly after finishing my MBA, I uh, moved to Europe and started with uh, a small company called Amazon. And I knew, <laughs> I knew them uh, back then. Uh, it, it was only about an $8 billion company. Uh, our stock price was about 30 bucks. Oh. And uh, I was struggling to get to, uh, to 35. Uh, Fascinating, fascinating to, uh, to be in that company. And I was talking to people there that was in the company for 10 years. And after a couple of months in that company, I was wondering, those people are crazy. Like, how can they stay 10 years in this company? And the reason I say that is a year at Amazon is like two years anywhere else. Uh, because we have nine months where we prepare for peak, uh, and that's January to September, and then we have peak. Um, and that's what I was saying, Aaron, is uh, being pretty busy right now preparing for peak. There's this little pesky thing called Thanksgiving, Black Friday, Cyber Monday, uh, Christmas, gifting. So lots of work going on. And it has been a fascinating journey, and I'm very, very happy to, uh, to be here and talk to you about it. So uh, as I mentioned, uh, Chris Bauer graduated in 2004, uh, moved to Luxembourg in 2005, worked for four years there, was in charge of uh, sales and operations planning for EU, uh, for all of Amazon, uh, and SNOP is just about the nervous communication center between the different fulfillment centers, finance, retail teams, uh, hundreds of different stakeholders that you have to uh, whip pretty much every week to get numbers in time and plan for the next 13 weeks to the next two years. Um, if you have never been to Luxembourg, it's about a 500,000 person country. It is small. The city itself is about 80,000 people at night, 140,000 people during the day. It's a banker's town. Opens at 10 a.m., closes at 5 p.m. It's like there is nothing to do. So after four years, uh, I was very, very happy with Amazon. But after four years, I say, all right, time out. We, we have to go. And we moved to Seattle. Uh, granted, it was in the midst of the worst financial crisis uh, we had known in a, in a long time. And was able to move to Seattle with Amazon, uh, spent six years there, uh, three years in retail. And that was a fascinating journey, understanding what our customers are interested about, how difficult and complex it is to go to the website to find the item that you really want. Um, and then uh, finally, uh, the last three years in Seattle was in charge of the expansion of our fulfillment network. Uh, how many fulfillment centers do we need? Where do we need them? How big do they need to be? And always in the mindset of getting closer to customers and being able to do that at a cheaper cost. Uh, 2015 was a bit of a, a, a tough year for me uh, because my wife got accepted to grad school in Los Angeles. Uh, not tough, but it was difficult because I had to make a choice. Do I want to leave Amazon or do I want to stay at Amazon? And if you have never been in a company that you really cherish and love, it's the toughest decision that you can have. And I was extremely fortunate to continue my journey with Amazon and be in charge of Prime now. Uh, when I joined Prime now, I was like, all right, how, is it, is it going to, how difficult is it going to be to handle small facilities spread out across the US? I was in charge of hundreds of different warehouses across the US, driving the expansion, the strategic planning, handling a couple of warehouses should be easy enough. No, no when you start adding frozen pizzas, ice cream, uh, eggs, milk, it becomes very, very challenging. In any case, uh, I, I think I'm in a pretty good position to tell you a bit more about how Amazon approaches programs, uh, what makes Amazon a unique place to work for and to be a customer of, and hopefully be able to, uh, to share a couple of, uh, of exciting anecdotes along the way. Um, so if you don't know about Amazon, uh, it's actually fascinating because in 97, uh, in the very first uh, letter to shareholders that Jeff Bezos put together, he established very clearly what we were going to be. And we were going to be the world's most customer-centric company. It's a tough choice. What does that mean? And really, uh, how often have you gone to Amazon looking for a product and actually ended up buying something completely different? Does that ring a bell? 
Yeah, and that's exactly what happens is uh, we want this company, Amazon, to be the place where you find everything that you want, even though you don't necessarily know that you wanted it. <laughs> uh, and, and we do that through three things, uh, price, selection, and convenience. Uh, and, and that's fascinating when you think about it. These are the three things that you can never go wrong about. Prices. Who wants to pay more tomorrow for something that they're buying today? No? No? All right. OK. Selection. Who wants to find less selection in store than you need? So you have to find and wonder if you're going to find it. Probably not. And convenience is who wants it slower? <laughs> Okay, no one. Uh, all right, good. So I think we're, we're onto something. And uh, by the way, it's a relatively short presentation, and I want it to be absolutely interactive. I enjoy, my, uh, I enjoy hearing myself talk. That's not the problem. But I want you guys to ask questions as we go along. I, I'm really looking to give you what you want from that presentation. I'm here for you. So if you have a question, if something is unclear, if I'm here, Speaking Amazon jargon, please raise your hand, ask a question. I would absolutely not mind. So customer centricity, what does that mean? Well, that means starting with a customer and working backwards. How is it different? Like, wh why is it that important? Two things. Most of the companies out there are competitor focused. They're thinking about the other company. They're thinking about what are they doing? How can we beat them? And you hear that often and often and often again. It's not that interesting to us. Uh, it's a great strategy if you want to be a fast follower or if you want to just uh, like have someone in your site and try to get them. Uh, but it's not the position you want to be in if you want to continue innovate. Uh, because what if you become number one? Then what are you going to do? Who are you going to obsess over? If you're customer focused, customer centric, it makes it a lot easier to know what are you interested in? What are you interested about? And the way we do this is whenever we're working on a program, on a project, we put what we call a PR FAQ document together. Uh, so taking a quick step back, this is very weird for me to actually put a presentation together. I haven't used PowerPoint in years. And the reason for that is Amazon use documents to convey ideas, to convince, to get funding. It's extremely easy in some respect to convince people in a presentation. It's a lot harder when you have a one hour meeting, a 90 minute meeting, and you put a document in front of those people, and the first half of the meeting is quiet, and people are reading your document. And when you're writing that document, and you see people circling it, putting huge question marks, crossing huge section, <laughs> like, damn it, what did I miss? Um, and it's actually, a great way to force yourself to put the assumptions on paper and to also start thinking about what the customer wants. And that's the concept as well of the PR FAQ. PR for press release, FAQ for uh, frequently asked questions. And the, the format of a PR FAQ at Amazon is usually two to six pages of uh, press release. So it's a two-pager press release and a four-pages FAQ. And that's what we call a six-pager. If you write an eight-pager, it's too long. If you write a four-pager, that might be too short. And there is this, uh, this saying that says, I didn't have time to write you a short letter, so I wrote you a long one. It's exactly it. You have no idea how much it takes to convey complex ideas in a very short document. It shows that you spend time thinking about the project and the product and about our customers. It shows that you understand what is critical and you're just trying to not trying to fill just void. And it shows also care for the person who's going to read it. And being able to lay out your assumption in a document that makes sense is key. So customer centricity, the whole PR FAQ process is essential. You're looking at Amazon Prime. You're looking at Prime now. All of those big ideas started with a PR FAQ. We think there is a need. And we believe this is the answer to a Get to provide that, uh, to answer that need. Uh, looking at Prime now specifically, how long do you think it took between the PRFAQ and the day we launched? Half a year, a couple of years, 111 days. We launched on December 14, 2014 in New York. 
after 111 days, uh, after the <laughs> presentation 111 days ago in front of Jeff B. And that is super exciting uh, because we saw an opportunity to answer a need. And that's, I will talk about some of our uh, leadership principles, that's bias for action. We think that we can answer that need very, very quickly. And that's true. Uh, Amazon has always been quoted uh, in a long time as, we'll never be able to bridge that instant gratification. Have you heard of that? The fact that right now I can go to any store and get my, I don't know, hard drive, TV in a couple of hours because I have to go there, I hope the item is there, and then I have to come back. Prime now answers that need. I, I can be home watching a movie, cooking, doing something funny, and have my TV delivered to me within two hours. So that is how we approach all the problems at Amazon. In all of the meetings, uh, we think about the customer. And it has been an absolutely exciting journey to be in this company. Uh, and I, what I call the, the defining moment when you're thinking about how we're approaching customers. Uh, and I have a couple of examples. Uh, the very first meeting I had in, uh, in Luxembourg was about uh, the Mamma Mia DVD. I think about the details that you remember. That was 12 years ago. And it was a new release. Uh, it was the biggest pre-order we ever had. Uh, we had hundreds of thousands of customer demand. And a week before the release date, our competitor goes in and instead of selling it for $12.99 or £12.99, sold it for $7.99. Half an hour meeting. The VP of the country saying, what are we doing? It took us 30 seconds to say, well, we're going to give a five pound gift certificate to all of our customers. It took us 29 minutes to figure out how we're going to communicate, to communicate it and how we're going to execute it from a technical standpoint because we had never done such a, a refund at that scale. Think about how it's changing the mindset of the company. When you think about the customer first and saying, we are not going to let the customers down because they decided they chose to pre-order with us. This is fantastic. It was a two million pound decision done in 30 seconds. It is crazy. I know a lot of companies who have gone and said, well, too bad. <laughs> but that is not the way we're approaching it. The second one uh, was also, it, it's fascinating how uh, people need to be reminded to be customer centric sometimes. Uh, speed is essential whenever you're placing uh, an order on Amazon. And there was a day where we have what we call a theft too. Uh, it's a, a ticket, so an escalation saying, hey, we, we're not seeing any customer orders dropping in our fulfillment centers. That means we don't have any work. What's going on? And tracing it back, we found out that there was an issue when one, with one of our fraud systems. So one of the fraud databases was actually sidelining all of the orders because it didn't know if it was a fraudulent order or not. And it got, went on for a couple of hours. And Jeff B sent an email saying, guys, you, you're looking at it the wrong way. If you stop focusing on how to speed up that process and the resolution, if you are blocking orders, release the orders to the fulfillment centers. Because we should never impact 99.99% of our customers because 0.1% may try to take advantage of us. That is a defining moment in my mind because again, it's putting the customers first. We are willing to lose money in the short term for the long term of the company. So this is what we call the, the virtual circle. And whenever we're approaching uh, problems, programs, we think about it. it. Growth. Growth of the company is essential. Uh, as Aaron mentioned, after finishing my MBA, I went to Sony. And I joined, I was fortunate enough to join the, the Sony manufacturing uh, division in Rancho Bernardo. Beautiful space. Uh, it was probably about a 100,000 square foot facility. They used to produce 10,000 computers a day. And when I arrived, it was 1,000 uh, computers a day. And they were really, really gearing forward about 500 customers uh, a day. And I, was, <laughs> I, I joined that company, and I was happy to join the company. But my point is, why join a company or a division that is going down or that is gearing towards a decrease? Growth, growth is essential. Never do anything that can slow down growth. I used to be in retail for three years, as I mentioned, in Seattle. And one of our uh, vendors didn't like some of the pricing decisions we, were, we used to make. 
uh, they thought they were underselling the products. We thought we were trying to gain market share unjustly, unfairly. Uh, we have a process for it. We, we knew exactly what we were doing. And we show them. We say, all right, we will listen to you. We will show you what happens when you don't let us handle your prices according to what we think is best. We'll go exactly to what you think is best. And they ended up growing negatively year over year. They started actually selling fewer products through us than they did the year before. They freaked out. They absolutely freaked out. So they turned around saying, guys, you, you know what you're doing best. Go ahead. They never recovered from that slowdown, ever. And they, it didn't matter how much money they were putting on marketing. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> um, they, they never, it didn't really matter is that customers came to our site, found out that they could find the products cheaper somewhere else, and decided that Amazon was not the best place for those products anymore. So every time you're thinking about making a decision, think about how that short-term impact, that short-term benefit can actually impact your long-term range. So don't impact your growth. And that's how we're, we're approaching uh, basically the, the growth of the company. We're focusing on selection. We're focusing on lower prices that is driving customer experience. When you have good customer experience, what do you say? What do you do? You come back. You talk to your friends about it. That's driving traffic. Traffic is bringing sellers to the platform. Amazon is a platform, in case you don't know. We sell stuff. People on our platform sell stuff. And all of that brings additional selection, brings better prices, which in turn brings customer experience. And every, I would say, program initiative looks at it of how are we going to bring this flywheel, as we call it, into the company? Are we slowing it down? Are we allowing it to move faster? Um, that's how a lot of different programs started. AWS, Amazon Web Services. God, we had one of the biggest data warehouse systems in the world, and it was failing us again and again and again. So what did Amazon decide to do? They built elemental blocks, uh, data warehouse services, database, programs to handle large amounts of data. And they started using it internally and selling it externally. That's brilliant. Um, in any case, <laughs> well, what's, <laughs> what's next? Yeah. So it took me a while to work on that flight path. Um, <laughs> innovation. So all of that is bringing innovation. All of that is how, what our customers want. And one thing that we uh, quickly found out is that they, they didn't want the phone. So don't look at that. Um, <laughs> Fire TV, Echo, Kindles, uh, the, the one-click buttons, the drones. We're trying the drones. Every time I talk to someone, they're talking about when am I going to get the drone delivery. Say, hey, who cares about it? Use Prime now. Get your, get your items delivered in an hour. That's fine. Uh, but what is very, very interesting is we're willing to fail. We're willing to try things. And, and it's fascinating. You, you cannot bet everything on one product. But we have reached a scale where we can try many different things and fail. Uh, if you guys have never read the book, Good to Great, it's Exactly. It's fascinating to see the parallels between Amazon and this book. The book talks about the fact that nothing is going to make you successful overnight. Like Amazon is a 20-year-long success that happened overnight, kind of. Uh, and, and that's a fascinating piece, that every day continue pushing the envelope, continue working on what makes sense, and continue working on what will delight your customers. You will often hear that at Amazon when you're getting into a conference room. Customer delight, the wow factor. How many of you had a bad experience with Amazon that we couldn't fix through customer service? Send me an email. Uh, <laughs> because that, I love to say, uh, Amazon.com was built for Amazonians. We are on that website so many times every single day, checking things, buying things, unfortunately, um, that I have a feeling that we built it for ourselves and we allow our customers to use it for their, for their own pleasure. Um, but all of, this, all of those innovations are happening because we get continuously better. We are trying different things. Uh, the, if you look at all of those innovations, 
in many cases, we went on. We went in with a product that was maybe 80 to 90% there. And the key there is try things. Be willing to fail. Because the cost of not taking an action, of not doing anything, is an action in itself. And you may miss the mark. A couple of years ago, there were a couple of lamb grabs that we had to go after, and Prime Now was one of them. No one could offer two-hour delivery consistently. No one could offer one-hour delivery consistently. And Prime Now is able to do that. Um, so a bit of ads if you haven't seen Prime Now. There you go. That's hilarious when you think about it. The, the code name for Prime Now within the company was Houdini. Houdini? As you say it in English. And it really is the case because it works like magic. Uh, there was a couple of times where we had to use the one hour delivery service. Uh, and of course it happens at 9.30 PM when you forgot to buy something. Um, I remember this time where my wife needed a, a compact flash memory card and placed the order, it got delivered in half an hour. It's ridiculously fast and it was like magic. Didn't have to worry about it. It was a guy who came in with a motorcycle, just dropped it off, just bye. And that, that is, again, the customer delight. Uh, it's about trying to get to the customer what they want and then how do you then leverage anything that you're building? So you're looking at Prime now, the complexity of Prime now uh, rises from the fact that, one, we want to be able to deliver within uh, an hour to two hours. So you need to be extremely close to customers. Uh, two, uh, <laughs> if you're looking at our typical warehouses at Amazon, they tend to be million square foot facilities about one to two hours away from the nearest town center. Uh, so we couldn't use those facilities. And even if you were to look at those facilities, it usually takes about five to 10 minutes to go from one end to the other. So that would then work. So when we were looking at Prime Now, we had to build a facility that was as close to customers as possible. Um, I mean, I don't know if there's a story behind it, but the O that you use in Now, so the clock is at 11. Is there a particular reason why it was chosen to be that way? Or it's just a branding decision? It's the 11th hour. <laughs> uh, because it's probably a, a design decision. There is nothing uh, that I'm aware of. Um, so going back to uh, finding the right facility, you're looking at a facility that is right in the middle of the city. And we couldn't use UPS, USPS or FedEx to deliver those items. So we contracted our own DSPs, delivery service providers, to handle those deliveries for us, which we never did in the past. Uh, but now we ended up in a situation where we had those facilities, we had DSPs. What else can we do with those delivery service providers? So now we have restaurants. You can order delivery, food delivery within an hour. We have what we call uh, Copperfield or Merchant, so Houdini, Copperfield. Um, <laughs> And it's uh, where we go into supermarkets for you and do your grocery shopping and deliver it to you. Because we delivered that infrastructure, we built that infrastructure that can support this. And that, that's the fantastic piece is once you start building some infrastructure, how do you leverage it to grow and to deliver better uh, customer service? And it was very similar. Uh, when, when you're customer centric, you do not care about 
how pissed people are going to be about your decisions. I'm going to uh, bring you very, very far back into the past. Uh, there was a point of time where Amazon was A to Z. We wanted to offer everything under the banner of the alphabet in terms of selection. And we had Amazon, the Amazon store, and the Z shop. And the Z shop was all of the merchants, uh, mom and pop shops that could sell things online. It, you, you probably don't realize that now, but there was a point of time where we actually merged those two. And it, it brought a lot of uproar, even within the company. We had retail managers saying, I am in charge of books. And now you're bringing those companies that are competing with me. I am part of Amazon. Why is me, Amazon, trying to compete with someone else? Because it's customer centric. Because you're trying to drive the best selection. First of all, there are times where we're not in stock. For the customer, going to one single detail page and being able to see an item always in stock has value. Two, sometimes you don't have the better price. Having a merchant on the detail page being able to offer that better price is great for the customer. And three, now we're getting even further out uh, because in the past when you were buying from a merchant, you weren't sure if you were going to get it. So that's why we, are the, uh, uh, we move forward with FBA, fulfilled by Amazon. We leverage all of the warehouses that we created across the country to warehouse items from merchants, and Amazon will ship it to you. So oftentimes you see items that are prime on the website that are not sold by Amazon. Again, that's that customer centricity of building an infrastructure, leveraging to get more of it, again, for the purpose of the customer. And that's how you go from one place to another. You start creating different programs to address different needs. There was a point of time where I had to tell people Amazon is more than just books. It's definitely a lot more than just books. There was a question? Yeah, um, so you know, the move to these smaller fulfillment centers is predicated on like a better predictive algorithm, right? That you know that people are gonna order this before they're gonna order it. And so I'm wondering, like chicken and an egg, did the algorithm come first and go, hey, we got this cool algorithm, we can move to smaller facilities now, or is it we want to get closer <coughs> to the instant gratification, so we need a better predictive algorithm? I don't know what you can share about that, but anything. Uh, that, that's a great, great question. Um, so you're probably all familiar with Amazon and what you can buy on Amazon.com. When we started Prime Now, our goal was to extend what Amazon.com has to offer. How do we get the same products to our customers faster? What was very interesting is with Prime Now, we found out our customers were interested in consumables items. Something that you, you go on Amazon, you want a box of cereals, and you have to buy a six-pack box of cereals. Not super convenient, especially if you live in New York. With Prime Now, we can actually deliver that one box of cereal. And then we started thinking about what do our customers want? Oh, they want ice cream, frozen pizza, something that we were never selling on Amazon.com before. So to answer your question, both of both worlds is we're trying to find out what our customers want, and we put it in the building and see if it sells. But there is also a point of time where we listen to our customers and the customer feedback. We go on Twitter, we go on <laughs> Instagram, we listen to the voice of our customers. And there was a point of time where they say, hey, why? It's great to have two-hour delivery, but honestly, I want frozen pizza, I want milk, I want eggs. And we started sourcing that, which was a huge shift in our uh, distribution model or sourcing model. Uh, in the past, we used to source everything from Amazon.com, the big warehouses across the network, across the country. And now we started having to go to distributors and saying, I need avocado, I need bananas, I need raspberries, something that we never used to do with Amazon.com. So, it, it, it's both. We try to make the best informed decision, but we also listen to what our customers want and we adapt. Last week, uh, I think it was the Wall Street Journal posted a story about virtual restaurants and Grubhub's investment in kitchen space for their clients, the restaurateur, to use, to not have any physical, actual restaurants someone could sit in, but exist only for delivery. Yeah. And I'm curious if that's something Amazon Prime now is, is, is doing or has plans to do in terms of investing in? We probably have plans to do everything. Uh, 
No, that was a great question. <laughs> so the, the question was Grubhub uh, started kind of offering uh, kitchen spaces for chefs to use uh, for delivery only uh, uh, items. So you wouldn't have a restaurant space. You would only have a kitchen to use and then Grubhub would do the delivery. Do we have plans to do something similar? At, at this point of time, not that I know of, and if we did, I wouldn't be able to speak about it. Uh, but that's a great segue into some of the interesting things that we do do. Four years ago, we started to wonder, what would shopping look like if you could walk into a store, grab what you want, and just go? What if we could weave the most advanced machine learning, computer vision, and AI into the very fabric of a store so you never have to wait in line? No lines, no checkouts, no registers. Welcome to Amazon Go. Use the Amazon Go app to enter. Then put away your phone and start shopping. It's really that simple. Take whatever you like. Anything you pick up is automatically added to your virtual cart. If you change your mind about that cupcake, just put it back. Our technology will update your virtual cart automatically. So how does it work? We used computer vision, deep learning algorithms, and sensor fusion, much like you'd find in self-driving cars. We call it Just Walk Out Technology. Once you've got everything you want, you can just go. When you leave, our Just Walk Out technology adds up your virtual cart and charges your Amazon account. Your receipt is sent straight to the app, and you can keep going. Amazon Go. No lines, no checkout. No, seriously. So this is interesting, going back to your point, because they actually have a fully furnished kitchen in this store. And it's absolutely fantastic to be able to go in. Like, how often have you gone to a grocery store and you're waiting, what? Already eight minutes left? Jeez, uh, I have about 33 more slides now. Um, and how often do you go into a location and you're spending more time at the checkout line than browsing the store? And I've tried it and it's absolutely insane. Insane. You had a question? I'm going to actually ask you a question about machine learning, but I won't because this sort of answers it. So I'm kind of curious, and you can answer it later on in the presentation if it comes up. Amazon's plans in the healthcare space, especially when it's hospitals and presumables like, you know, their uh, MRO items, if there's anything going on there or might go on there. I cannot talk about <laughs> ongoing projects. Um, I think there is, if there is a market, if there is anything where there is a lot of waste, and there is a lot of opportunities to better serve a customer, there is definitely someone at Amazon working on it and thinking about it. Some of the issues that I can think of from the top of my mind about healthcare is how regulated it is and how dangerous it is if you do something wrong. Uh, so uh, I think we want to be interested in that. But we also have a lot on our plate <laughs> to talk about. I thought there was another question. Yes. Yeah. Um, for the Amazon Go, so, I mean, what's the, the pool available? Is it more expensive or what's the deal? No, the idea is how do you make it more convenient to customers? And so it's, it's, it's going to be a lot less selection mm -hmm. uh, because the way it works is literally you have cameras all over the, uh, the ceiling watching what you take and making sure that they can charge you accordingly. Uh, so it, as far as I know, it's not more expensive than Ralph. The idea is more creating this uh, traffic generation for customers to come in and try new things, such as potentially like new restaurateur, new chefs. Is Amazon Go by any chance related to the purchase of Whole Foods? So we started Amazon Go before. Uh, the purchase of Whole Foods was in parallel, and it, it's very exciting. If you actually go to Prime now, you can start buying uh, Whole Foods 365 items. Uh, we have a selection of about 1,000 items peanut butter, uh, anything that is ambient temperature, and we're 
uh, we, we hope to be able to expand and provide more information. So the plan is happening from the whole school thing to Not that I know of. But I will not answer that. <laughs> so um, this is a little off track, but when you started uh, in Prime Now and uh, when food items got included in it, what was the biggest challenge you faced? <laughs> food, food safety. <laughs> I kid you not. Um, the floor of warehouses when you handle food is a completely different grade than when you handle consumer electronics, books, and DVDs. Uh, so that's, in many cases, one of our biggest expense is we go into a warehouse and we have to resurface the entire floor to be food compliant. Uh, on top of that, you don't want rats in your food. You don't want any of those things. So being able to actually have this kind of setup where you, you're moving with a workforce, that, a workforce that never had to deal with items that would go bad, or at least not go bad in days. Uh, so how do you establish the right training for your workforce that is very distributed, by the way, and in many cases is part-time? So how do you educate this workforce to be able to take this seriously and not drive uh, bad food safety compliance or things that could be detrimental to the customers down the line? Uh, also, the other piece is expiration, expiration date. It's OK when you're looking at cereals that expire a year from now, when you're looking at a bottle of milk that expires in three days. Like, how do you do this? How do you offer the right customer experience? If it's three days left on the expiration standpoint, is that OK to sell it to customers? Is that enough time? Yes, no. I, I just, I know we have about five minutes left. Uh, our location, so the key question is how do you maintain customer centricity? How do you maintain this mentality across hundreds of locations worldwide? And that's where I'm going to do a pitch for the Amazon leadership principles. Uh, if you've never heard of them, it's basically kind of the 14 uh, principles that we live or die by. We hire on those principles. We rate people yearly on those principles. And they are, in my mind, absolutely outstanding. A um, couple of ones that I want to bring up. Uh, customer obsession, that's our number one. That would have been surprising otherwise. Ownership. How often have you talked to someone and say, hey, I have this issue, and the person is like, not my problem? Ownership tells you, think about the problems that you're dealing with as an owner of the company. It doesn't mean ownership as, hey, I can carry this, product, this project from A to D, from the beginning to the completion. No, it's how are you thinking about your work, your job, your day-to-day -day life as an owner of the company and making sure you're making the right decisions for the future. How do we become a 100-year-old company? And that was some of the challenges I, I was talking to in uh, my former directors in Luxembourg, is that what is the key challenge that you're facing? Is, oh, well, it's uh, how are we going to uh, structure the company to be a $100 billion company? I'm like, geez, that's a long time, of, that's a long way back. Oh, it's a long way forward. And we hit that two or three years back. So it happens much faster than you think if you continue working on, uh, on the right projects. Um, bias for action, we talked about it. Uh, actions are reversible. There is no one-way door. So do something fast. Try it, see what happens. Worst case scenario, retract. Um, frugality is an interesting one. Uh, Amazon is very frugal, and at the same time, we spend $18 billion buying Whole Foods. Uh, how do you combine the two? Uh, the idea of frugality is approach a problem thinking that you are resource constrained. How would you solve it creatively? If, you have, if I give you a million dollars to solve a problem tomorrow, you're like, all right, I can think of, yeah, about 100,000 ways to spend a million dollars to solve that problem. If I tell you solve it with $10,000, like, all right, now I have to think. I have to find a way to do that. And if I do this, that means I can basically fund 100 more products or 100 more uh, problems uh, than if I just give you a million dollars. And uh, the last one, have backbone, disagree and commit. I love that one. Half backbone means if you think we're moving in the, right, uh, in the wrong direction, bring it up. Speak up. Again, you're an owner of this company. Do that respectively, like, <laughs> respectfully. Don't, don't come in and be, oh, I think you're wrong. I think that idea is stupid. No, just say, I'm not sure that's going to, to work. And here's data to prove it. 
that come back prepared have an informed uh, argument to say, I disagree. But if the room agrees that this is the path forward, commit. Don't be a blocker. How often did you have a project and someone's like, yeah, I think it's not going to work, and they never support you? This is the purpose of that leadership principle, is I disagree with you, I voiced my concerns, but I will go forward and I will we'll try it. And worst case scenario, we'll revert. Um, customers are very happy with us. Uh, again, we care about it and we don't care about it because it doesn't stop us. Being number one doesn't mean that's it, we're done. No, we're happy. How do we be even better year after year? Um, and I love this one. It's still day one. And the full quote is, it's still day one and we haven't had breakfast yet. And what is day two? There was this question. Uh, every quarter we have this, uh, what we call all hands meeting. Uh, we bring all of the company in uh, an arena and we talk and we have Jeff B and his uh, S team, uh, senior team talking and answering questions. And that was the question is that what does day two look like? Day two is death. Day two is we're happy with what we have done. We don't think we need to push forward anymore. We don't want day two. Day one is there is something else. We haven't started yet. We're, <laughs> we're just getting warmed up. Um, and I, I would say in the end, uh, where are our choices? Build yourself a great story with a customer in mind. <laughs> Can I ask about uh, how Prime now is uh, control the cost? Because I think most of the business about Prime now is gonna about uh, fresh groceries, like uh, vegetables and meat. Yes. Yeah, how can you control? I know you have distribution centers and uh, facilities, but uh, I think building this infrastructure already a huge cost. Yeah, so how do we control the cost in Prime now? Uh, we try. <laughs> we look at many different things. Um, some of the key components, even for Amazon, uh, are actually delivery. Uh, being able to deliver uh, to customers very, very quickly means you have a dedicated uh, fleet to do that. So we control the cost by trying to leverage that, uh, that infrastructure as much as possible. When we're, you're specifically talking about meat produce, uh, we just have reports. We review our what we call stock loss, wastage every day, making sure that, hey, did I buy too many bananas? Do I buy, did I buy too many tomatoes? And we balance, do we want to throw away products or do I want to be in stock? And that's actually a very fascinating uh, question. Um, when I uh, did a project for Starbucks years, years ago, uh, we were looking at muffins. Uh, and the, the whole idea of, are Starbucks stores carrying enough muffins at any given point of time? And they had this metric, uh, and I don't remember the exact metric, but what we found out is that that metric was actually forcing the sites, or I would say pushing the sites to order fewer muffins to have a better metric. But that also led the fact that those stores were out of stock more often. And using uh, the newspaper delivery boy model, uh, we showed the Starbucks ex executive that if you were able to reduce your case pack, so instead of buying four muffins in cases you were to buy two muffins at each time, you could actually increase your profits by about $10 million in the year. It was at the time where I think Starbucks was making about $40 million in profit. So that was a huge impact on the profitability. Um, so you want to make sure you balance the customer experience of being in stock with the risk of, being, uh, of throwing away your products. And in some cases, it is okay to throw away your products. If you throw away 90% of them, that's not good. But if you throw away three, five percent, that's actually the cost of doing business. Were your suppliers that uh, supply the, the products that you sell on Amazon, do you have a rating system for them? We do have scorecards. Uh, we do have scorecards very established for Amazon.com. For Prime now, we're still working through that on what, what makes the most sense. Uh, because we've evolved so quickly um, that it, it could get better. We don't necessarily have 
all of the data that we want to show uh, a vendor that they are not helping us from a cost standpoint. But we, we established that and we have quarterly reviews with our vendors. So, uh, as you know, Walmart coordinated UPS. So how do you think uh, Amazon can compete with Walmart and UPS? Such as Prime to compete with UPS, so the speed or the... Compete in what respect? So how, uh, I'm trying to understand the question. So Walmart and UPS partnered, yeah. how does Amazon compete? Yeah. And compete in what respect? In terms of cost, in terms of service, delivery? Yeah, such as the customer experience or the future attendance. Uh, honestly, I think we continue focusing on what makes sense for Amazon, which is, or for customers, which is selection, pricing, convenience. Yeah. We already have uh, a network that delivers same day if we want to. Uh, so if you go on Amazon.com, you actually can select same day delivery if you order before noon and get your delivery, uh, you're okay to get your delivery by 9 p.m. So I, I think in that specific case, I think Walmart is more catching up with Amazon than really trying to plot the, the step forward. So I, I think they're more fast followers in that case. Uh, uh, we cannot make sure UPS can catch up your speed, such as uh, keep the pace, with Amazon Prime the speed, you know. Maybe in the future, UPS will increase their speed <laughs> to the same speed. So that, that's a good question. Uh, is UPS able to, uh, to match the Amazon speed? Well, we, we're, in many cases, we're building our own fleet as well. Uh, if you heard of uh, Prime Air, we actually have, I think it's 20 uh, airplanes flying across the country to move packages and products between facilities. Yeah. So we, we're, we're trying to continue being innovating uh, in that space. Okay. So, so another question. Uh, you, uh, you, can, uh, you enter other countries for uh, uh, international markets. So what's your core competency with other competing firms, such as in Asia, uh, Alibaba? You know, so mm -hmm. How can you compete with them? It's a good question. What is our core competency? And I, I think I mentioned it, which is, again, selection, price, convenience. Yeah. Uh, it is. It's not necessarily one of them in particular. Okay. It's the three of them combined. Yeah. And when you're looking at pricing or value, uh, we're not trying, we're not striving to be the cheapest in the market. Uh -huh. We're trying to be the best value for the customer. Okay. How often do you do a search? Uh, that's a good point, actually. Uh, most of the product search on the internet start with Amazon because we have a great catalog of products, we have customer reviews, we have a lot of selection, and we're often in stock. But we also see a lot of websites offering the same products for cheaper. Yeah. But would you really trust uh, crazydeal.com <laughs> to sell you a $1,200 DSLR camera? Yeah. Maybe. If you have a good credit card, uh, who is willing to reimburse you if you never receive the product? And maybe Amazon will sell it for $12.50. So a bit more expensive. But with Amazon, there are three things that I know. One, they have the product that I want. Two, I know it's going to be a fair price. And three, if I don't receive it or anything wrong happens, they will take care of me. And that is something that we have amazing world-class customer service. And I'm not saying that because I work for Amazon. I'm saying that because I have used them and abused them so many times <laughs> that I know. Yeah. I remember that time where I bought a blender and it was a base where you had to screw and unscrew to clean it, it was a pain. And somehow I broke it on the very first use. I called customer service and they said, oh, no problem, we'll send you a replacement. I received it the next day. I didn't ask for that. I just say, I have an issue that I think the glass was defective, truly. Uh, and they sent it overnight at a huge cost to the company. I didn't want it, but I, I was wowed. I was like, this is crazy. Like, if you guys do that for me, I, I'll be with you forever. And I'm willing to pay more for that service, for that peace of mind. There is a point of time where you're realizing that the headache you're creating yourself by trying to save 50 cents, a dollar, sometimes hundred dollars, is not worth it. Because in the example I gave you, where you're trying to buy a camera for $1,200 and it never arrives, then you have to take time 
to actually get your credit card statement, find out, follow up with the company, and so on and so forth. It's not worth it. So if I were to provide, like the one core competency of Amazon is a mind share. We're giving you time back. And we're delighting you in the process. Uh, I'm curious as to how you handle your delivery <clears throat> channels across different international markets and what, how do you adapt your uh, operate, standard operation procedures across countries. For example, uh, one thing I observed here is when people deliver, they do not call even if you're not there. They just place it in front of your door. But if you do the same thing in, say, India, <laughs> you would never find that product outside. <laughs> so, <laughs> they would probably come down and call, uh, call saying that your product is here, you have your sign it, saying that you received it. So how do you manage all that stuff across different international markets? We have dedicated teams that, uh, that make sure that we have the right service level for the right location. Uh, and on top of that, we, we have amazing data over time. We find out that if we leave a package in the same location five times in a row and four times in a row, it, gets, it disappears. We know that we need to adapt and do something different. Uh, but also, we're, we're willing to try different things. Uh, I'm always amazed with Amazon leaving $1,000 items in front of my doorstep. What? <laughs> uh, but that's also because we have reached such a level that we're working with our delivery providers where they ensure that the package gets uh, delivered and we work with them and we open investigating cases if we don't have, <laughs> if we see something, an abuse being, uh, being created. So we, we, we track all of this and we have the data behind it. A kind of acquisition question. When you're hiring people, at any level in your, or your part of Amazon, what is it that you are seeing that you wish schools like us could do even better? What, what, what are those pieces that are missing that could easily be fixed, but if we, if we don't know what that is, we, can, we can't do it? I think it's hard. Uh, a lot of the things that we're looking for, in many cases, cannot be taught. It's about the innate person. I, I know the three things that I look at when I hire someone is this drive. Are you going to be someone that is going to create headaches for me? Or are you going to be someone who is going to solve my problems before I even know it's a problem? Are you going to be someone I have to poke every morning to actually get something done? Or, as my boss once told me, you give it, and I don't have to worry about it. That's number one. This is not something I can be taught. This is something that is innate. Oops, sorry about that. Um, the second point is analytics. That can be taught. It is absolutely incredible how many people I interview that don't know Excel, that don't know SQL. You, show, you ask them questions, say, I have no idea. I have, like, the, the biggest data set that I've used is like 20 rows. It's like it's nothing. I deal with millions of rows, uh, and I'm not comparing rows, no. Um, <laughs> the, that, that's a key thing, is that being able to get huge data sets and make sense out of it is something that will always serve you. And I absolutely encourage you to do that. That's probably one of the things that can be taught. Because uh, I, I remember some of the problems I had to uh, to deal with, not in your class, your class was tough. Um, <laughs> but I get a data set that has three columns and say, well, how do you get the data that you want? Well, it's easy, I have three columns. What happens when you have 250 columns, 250 different attributes? How do you know which attribute actually makes sense and drives something? So how do you create this ambiguous context, which is daily life, of you have access to a gazillion sources of data? and you have to make a decision. That, that's something that I love to see from a school. Of, I, 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 can, I can help with anything that you throw at me. It can be ambiguous, it can be super defined, I will help. And the third one is uh, communication. As I mentioned, Amazon is a two, four, six pager company. If you don't know how to write, it's going to be very difficult for me to hire you. If you don't know how to speak and present your ideas, it's going to be very, very difficult for me to hire you. And I, I will twist your, your question a little bit, like how do we hire? And the way we hire externally is you have a panel. 
And that's brutal panel because it's going, you're going to be talking to four to six people for 45 minutes each. And each one of them is going to drill into a specific set of the leadership principles. So I may be assigned dive deep. And so I will be asking you a question. Is that, so what is the biggest problem that you had to solve? How many layers did you have to go down to find the solution? Who did you involve? Did you, use, did you pull the data yourself or was the data given to you? Another person will say, so you want to be a manager? Great. What was the biggest team that you hired? How did you manage them? How, who was your top performer? Why? Who was your bottom performer? Why? Did you hire the team? Did you inherit the team? How were you structuring the team so that you knew what they were working on without being every single day in the details? And finally, another person could be, all right, so what was the fastest decision you had to make without data and you had to use your gut? I mean, these are questions, and you can find them online. None of the questions that we use are like trying to make you trip. That, that's not the point of the questions we ask. We want to find out what moves you at the core. And are you someone who makes informed decisions, use valid assumptions? Most of the business, uh, business problems that we face, we don't know. We don't have the data. But we use assumptions. We know that whenever we ship a package or several units at once to a customer, on average, we'll ship two units. What happens? And so on and so forth. And if the assumptions are wrong, how do we tweak them? How do we improve them over time? So once you have this panel, six people, one of them is always outside of your team. It's going to be an external person from Amazon, another part of Amazon, who is going to be what we call the bar raiser. And the goal of that person is to ensure that we hire someone who is going to raise the bar for Amazon. Is this higher? Is that candidate better than 50% of the people in that job? Why? What is the superpower of that person? Why should we hire him? Why should we not hire him? Why should the hiring manager know, not know about this person? We want to know everything. Uh, and that is absolutely brutal because you end up having a, a debate about candidates. Uh, after the panel, everyone enters their feedback. Sometimes it's short, sometimes it's long. Doesn't, doesn't influence a decision. And you have to put a vote. Are you inclined? Strongly inclined. Like this is the best invention since sliced bread. Or are you, uh, no, don't hire. Or absolutely don't hire. Like absolutely the wrong fit for Amazon. And I love to say that Amazon is not for everyone. And not everyone is right for Amazon. It is not a reflection of you. We want you to be successful when you join the company. But it's also a very difficult company to join. I, I, I hear oftentimes that it's harder every single year to join Amazon. And I know because I wouldn't be hired now uh, if I were to apply. <laughs> so it is extremely impressive to get an offer from Amazon. Uh, I like to say that Amazon is where people, overachievers come to feel bad about themselves. Um, <laughs> Does that answer your question? Any other questions? Yes? In the large distribution, uh, on the relationship with your suppliers, so for the Amazon-owned items, um, do you have your own distribution centers or, or fulfillment centers? But do you also leverage the, the suppliers or warehouses to prevent delivery for many places that you um, have distribution goes into the customer? That's a great question. Uh, and that, that's usually a challenge that we face every single year. Uh, I have never heard at Amazon that our warehouses will not be full during Q, uh, Q4, during November. Uh, and there are times where we're reaching a point where 1% deviation in our forecast, in our fullness level, means one building. So you cannot be wrong. <laughs> And some of the things that we're doing is that why should we invest, like thinking again about that frugality mindset, why should we invest in a full building for one month and carry the fixed cost for years to come? Which is a healthy debate that we have on a regular basis. Um, we, we do things. Uh, we created some programs called VendorFlex. 
uh, which is we go into uh, Samsung Philips facility, we cordon off 10,000 square feet, and we operate a mini Amazon warehouse. The issue of that is that it only works well when you have products that are expensive. Some of the value of Amazon, one of the things that we do very well is what we call multi-shipment. Is the fact that you come to Amazon, you order five different products, and we hope those five products will come in the same box. Because that's where you're able to leverage the shipping cost of one box across five items. That allows us to get to the lower prices again. So whenever you go into those facilities, yes, you're able to extend your capacity, but on a very, very, very narrow set of products. You're talking about 100 SKUs, maybe 200, maybe 1,000. We sell millions. So I'll, we'll stop there. Maybe you have a few more minutes. I have plenty of minutes. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you.